Can we put up this scripture, please? Psalm 48. Psalm 48, verse 1. Looking at the city of God once again in our series today. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. We're going to sing that this morning. We're going to sing a song that's based on this psalm. In the city of our God, his holy mountain. So what God's saying is not just that, obviously, or what the psalm is saying is not just that the Lord is great and worthy of praise. In other words, when something's worthy, it means it's worth paying it for it. Yeah? So if you've got an item of clothing and you paid £10 for it, you think it was worth £10. If it was £20, you think it was worth £20. If you've got a T-shirt that you think was worth £30, you're dumb. Because <laughs> no T-shirt is worth whatever logo's on it. It's not worth it. Some people think otherwise. That's okay, there are dumb people around. <laughs> They're all made in the same shop in China, whatever logo's on it. <laughs> but great is the Lord and worthy. He's worth praising. He's worth paying that price. Yeah, when you praise God in the temple, you, took an, you had to take an offering. And, and, and what you thought God was worth, that's the offering you gave. Yeah? In the city of our God. We're looking at this series about what that city is. Yeah, and the conclusion is it's the church. You are in the city of God. It's coming in its finality, but we're, we're in God's presence now. His holy mountain. We're going to look at the holy city of God this morning, what that means. Next verse. Beautiful in its loftiness, the joy of the whole earth, like the house of Zaphon, that's the mountains of the north, is Mount Zion, the city of the great king. We've been looking at this. The joy of the whole earth is being in this city. You see, there's not as many amens because you're not, you're not quite sure about that one, are you? The joy of the whole earth is coming to church. Yes. And if you knew what was coming on the world, you'd realize your greatest joy is being in the church. Because you don't want to be in the world. Because there's going to be no joy when, when that, that's dissolved. When that's judged. No. The joy of the whole earth is in the city of God. The city of the great king. The greatest joy, right? And this is not, this is not preferential. It's not like, oh no, I'd rather be out in the park eating ice cream. No, you're missing the point. You're created to be in God's presence. You will only fully understand that joy when you understand your connection to God. Jesus says, when I give you my joy, no one will take that joy from you. Because he knows you're created to be in relationship with him in the city of God. Yeah? Just jump to verse 8. I mean, actually, Psalm 48 is all about the city of God. It tells us to go look at it. As we have heard, so we have seen... In the city of the Lord Almighty, in the city of our God, God makes us secure forever. The purpose of church, everything we do, is so that you can see God more clearly. When we take communion, their eyes were opened when, they, when Jesus broke the bread. When we sing praises, I, Isaiah in the temple, he heard the, the cherubim singing, holy, 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 when he saw the praise given to God. That's why we're singing praise. That's why we're giving thanks. That's why we're worshiping. That's why we're teaching from the Bible. So you can see as we have heard so we have seen in the city so today in church you're going to see God if you can't it's not God's fault it's something in you that's blocking it and so we're going to do the best we can but seeing God this morning depends on the eyes of your heart the eyes of faith the best way to experience God is to open yourself up to him by giving him thanks and praise because he's worthy to be praised. Amen. Amen? Come on then, let's stand up in the Lord's presence. In the city of God, we sing praises to our God. Why? Because he is worth it. He deserves it. 
He is the one that we should give our full attention to in his holy city. So let's look to the Lord right now. Father, thank you once again. You've brought us into your presence, to your house, to your church, where we can experience your love, your joy, your peace, your comfort, all the wonderful attributes of your presence. But Lord, we want to give this sacrifice of thanksgiving and praise for you are worthy. Let us lift you up, Lord, with our voices, with our hearts, in our minds, with our hands. Let us lift up holy hands to you and give you all the praise, all the thanksgiving and all the worship, for thou art worthy. Amen. 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 Let's praise the Lord. Thank you, team. Okay, then, we're looking at the city of God. We're looking at this concept that God has given us to show us so many things tied up in this thing called the city of God, this place. And we've looked at this over the past couple of months. It's the city, it's the place of blessing. It's the place of righteousness. It's the city of peace, Yerushalayim. It's the city of Zion. It's the city of the blessing of God upon it. It's the city of the great king. It's the city of the high priest. It's all these things, this thing that God has prepared. God has prepared a city for those people who belong to him. So we're going to look at that again this morning. Let's go to Revelation chapter 21 and verse 2. Revelation 21 and verse 2. Now this is the final revelation of the city of God. Obviously it's happened all the way through the Bible. We're actually going to look at this tonight in our revelation study as well, which is a coincidence because the revelation study was postponed. So we're going to be looking at similar things tonight, but different. And so here's John saying, I saw the holy city. Yeah? It's written down. God said, write down what you see so that other people can see it. You're supposed to see this. You're supposed to see the city of God, not just God himself. You're supposed to understand what he's doing. So I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, clarifying what this city is, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. Next verse. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. And he will dwell with them. They will be his people. And God himself will be with them. And he will be their God. Jump to verse 10. So John says he saw the city. And so the angel who's showing him this city, he says he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Right, this is very subtle, but have you noticed? He saw the city, and now he's in the spirit, and he's shown the city. There's a difference between just seeing something and being shown something. Have you ever looked at something, and you've seen it, and then someone said, did you see that? And then you go, no. And then they show you. Look, and they oh, yeah, I never saw that. It's a principle of revelation in the Bible. You read the Bible and you see it, but you never really see it until it's shown to you. That's what biblical teaching should be. It's showing you something you've already seen. You should already know this. It's now showing it to you in greater revelation. That's what's happening here. So if you're in the spirit, you'll start to see this city in a different way, with more clarity, with more precision with more specific uh, analysis. And so now he's seeing it. He's seeing it in a place where God dwells, not just as an abstract thing. Everyone can see the church, but can you really see the church? Do you know God's there? Do you perceive him? Do you experience him? Does, do you, are you in contact with him? Or is it just an outward, oh, it's, it's, I'm going to church? Well, John's now seeing a place where God dwells. It's this, it's this mountain, it's this bride, it's this picture of all of these things on, on God's mountain. But have you noticed what, what it's called here? It's called the holy city. It's, it's not always called that. In fact, that's not one of its most common names. 
It's nearly always referred to as Jerusalem and the city of God. And in a general sense, it's called this city, Yer Shalom, the city of peace. It's always called the city of peace. That's what its name is. But here at the, at the end, it's called the holy city. That's what, in fact, every song we sang this morning had that word in it. The city of our God, the holy place. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Specifically, every song we sung, every song we sung this morning had that word in it. Why is God's city holy? What does that mean? Is it just, is it just another verb thrown in there to describe something because God likes calling things different names? No. God never does that. It's because God needs us to understand something very precise, very specific about where he wants us to be, where he's taking us, the actual condition of the people who live in this city. The word used is holy. It's the holy city. It's the holy place. And we're going to look at this aspect. Now, it's not called the holy city that much. At the end, it is. But throughout the Bible, it is mentioned that it's called the holy city. It's only about seven times it's mentioned in the New Testament as as this holy city. But specifically, why is it called that? Why doesn't God just call it Jerusalem? Well, it is Jerusalem, the holy city, Jerusalem. It is coming out of heaven, but it's the holy city of God. Do we understand this? Do we know what holiness means? What, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty mysterious word in our culture, this, this word holy. Is it just a title for something? Oh, he's holy. Oh, he thinks he's holy. And, and we throw it around and misuse that word quite a lot. But what does, what does this word actually mean? It's, is, it, is it functional? Yes, it is. Is it, is it describing a, a specific attribute? Yes, it is. And it has to be there or it's not holy. You can't just pretend something's holy. Now, you will notice that everything God asks us to do in Scripture is called holy. Have you noticed that? We're taking communion. No, we're taking holy communion. Yeah? This is his church. No, it's his holy church. Yeah? You're reading from the Bible. No, read the cover. It says the holy Bible. Yeah, because Bible just means book. This is the holy book. These are his holy words. God's people are called his holy people. Yeah, his angels are called the holy angels. And the cherubim, all they say in heaven is holy, holy, holy. Right? It's pretty, pretty clear in the Bible that that word is put on to only certain things. It's not on everything. And so... His city is now called, it has been called this before, it's called the holy city. What does that mean? Well, it means what we're going to look at this morning. Why is the city of God called the holy city? Do you want it to be a holy city? It is anyway, but what does that mean? Well, it's very, very important because it means there's only certain things can happen and only certain people can get in that to that city because it's a holy city. When something is holy... That means there's something very, there's a very specific list of attributes attached to something in the Bible that's called holy. When something's holy, it means there's only certain things can happen in connection with that thing. Jump to verse, um, oh, we're in 21. Jump to verse 27. We're going to look at this tonight in our Revelation study in more detail. Nothing impure will ever enter it. Do you know why? It's holy. When something's holy, nothing impure can come in. Nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, because they're not holy. So if you're doing something shameful or deceitful, you aren't, you aren't in the city of God and you're not getting in, because you're contaminated. Only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, only God's holy people are in the holy, holy city. Yeah? So let's just have that clear from the beginning. Let's go to the middle of the Bible then. Let's go to Psalms. Let's go to Psalm uh, 2, verse 1. Psalm 2 and verse... Actually, let's jump to verse 4. We'll not read the whole psalm. Psalm 2, verse 1. Psalm 2, 
verse 4. This is the psalm where God is saying he's appointing his king. Jesus is going to be made king of Jerusalem, king over all. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. He, the Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath. And he says, I have installed my king on Zion, Jerusalem. I have installed my king in Zion on my holy mountain. God's city is not just holy, it's on a holy mountain. Now, I'm not going to go into detail today, this morning. I'm going to talk about that tonight in the Revelation study. But the foundation of everything God does, the foundation of the city is the mountain. It's holy. Well, what does that mean? Well, you're going to get this as we, as, we, as we look at this in more detail. But the first thing to understand is, I have installed... It's already done. Jesus is already enthroned in heaven. It, we're, not, we're not waiting for God to do this. He's already done it. The city of God is already established. It's already prepared. God has prepared a city for them. It's already been done. God has prepared this city. He's established it. He's prepared it. He's done it. He's installed Jesus in this place, but it's on the principle of holiness. And that is never going to change because that's the foundation. God is never going to stop being holy and he's never going to allow his standards to drop. Some Christians think God was stricter in the Old Testament than he is in the New. Well, God's the same, but if you want to look at things like that, which is an erroneous way of studying, I would suggest God's stricter in the New Testament than he is in the Old Testament. Because Jesus says, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the teachers of the law, you won't inherit the kingdom of heaven. If you think Jesus, Jesus came to let you off from the law of Moses, you're reading, the, you're reading a different Bible than I've read. He didn't come to let you off at all. He came to fulfill it all. And he said that in the Sermon on the Mount. God never lowers his standards. His standard is holiness. His standard is purity and absolute righteousness, and the city of God is built on this. Only the holy people enter it, but remember, it's only God himself, ultimately, that is holy. In the first instance, that he makes things holy. The, the cherubim in heaven say, holy, holy, holy. The replication of the Trinity, because God the Father is holy, God the Son is holy, and the Spirit, we can't even call him the Holy Spirit, right? So we understand that principle. When we're coming to God, when we are ho hoping to enter the city of God, when we're coming to the church, it's on the foundation of holiness. Now, we, we tend to emphasize in our culture grace, which is true, because Jesus has come to bring us grace, but that doesn't mean we're to the exception of his holiness. Jesus gave grace and was still absolutely holy. The Bible's command in the New Testament is clear. You be holy because I'm holy. And because I'm holy, you will be holy. It's a clear command from God. He's not lowered his standards. God is who God is, and God is a holy God. And because God is a holy God, he expects everything that dwells in his place to be holy. Everything in the temple was holy. It's the Hebrew word uh, kodesh. And once something was Kadesh, now in your Bible, that word's translated several different things. Sometimes it's um, translated uh, sacred. Yeah? Sometimes it's translated sanctified. Sometimes it's just translated set apart. That is set apart for God. Sometimes it's translated holy. But it's the same word. It is Kadesh. The holy of holies is the Kadesh of Kadeshim. The holy of holies. And so God's foundation, even the mountain, even the city, it's called holy. Because that's what it is. Now, what does this word mean? Well, it, it, it means different things, but one thing at the same time. I think the first thing to understand is it means it's God's. 
Do you belong to God? Then you, by definition, are holy. But you can't just pretend. It's got to be real. Look at that in a minute, okay? Let's go to another psalm. Go to Psalm 87, verse 1. So God is holy. His city is holy. The mountain that he puts us on in the city is holy. Everything in the city is holy. And so God has founded his city on the holy mountain. Yeah? This is not just like an odd teaching in the Bible. It's like all the way through. It's one of the most consistent theological doctrines you can, you can get in the Bible. The Lord loves the gates of Zion. He loves this city more than all the other dwellings of Jacob. He loves all, all Israel. He loves all Jacob, but he loves this special place. Why? It's holy. He loves the city he's founded on the holy mountain. God loves it. Glorious things are said of you, city of God. So in other words, it's not just God that's holy and good things said about God. This city's holy. Now, God owns the city. God owns the mountain. It's God's foundation of everything he does. So everything that belongs to this is holy. You're holy. Your bride is holy. Your husband is holy. Right? Why? Why is, is Carolyn my wife? Why? How can you tell? Because she has given herself to me. We went through a ceremony. We exchanged vows. With this body, I thee honour. I give myself wholly unto you as long as we both shall live. Right? That's actually one of the clearest definitions of what holiness is. That's why marriage, despite people dropping the word today is legally called holy matrimony. Yeah? Because it's the principle of holiness. Holiness means you give yourself to that. Not a bit of yourself to that. I didn't say, I give a bit of me to you, but I'm going to keep some other bits for somebody else. If that had happened, she, if I'd said that, she'd have said, well, forget it then. I'll get someone else. That's the principle, one of the foundational principles of holiness. It's this principle. God loves the gates of Zion. Why does God love this city more, the, more, more than all the other cities? Because this city is totally his. But he owns everything. Not, no, not in the same way. This is the new heavenly Jerusalem that just belongs to God. There's nothing else, there's nothing in this city that, does, that is not his. And everything in this city is totally his. In this world, there's things say they belong to God, but they also belong to other things. There's people who say they belong to God, but they clearly, clearly give themselves to things God doesn't want them to give themselves to. That's no holiness. This city is the city God loves. Now, in the Bible, it says, Husbands, love your wives, washing them with the pure water of the word. And then it says, As Christ loves the church, making her clean and holy. So he has a holy, pure bride. Why? Because he loves her. Love your wives, husbands, as Christ loved the church. He died for her. He purchased her. He gives everything to her. He loves her. Why? Its foundation is built on holiness. He sanctified himself. He set himself, Christ himself, apart to belong to a bride that has set herself apart just to belong to him. You can't give yourself to anyone else. You have to give yourself to Jesus. You can't reserve pieces of yourself to give to the world. No, holy unto him. That's why God loves you. 
Now, doesn't God love everybody? In a general sense, yes, because God is love. But the actual act of consummation of marriage is only between those who have consecrated themselves in holy matrimony. And that's the foundational principle of what we're looking at. It's the city God loves. It's the city that's his bride. We've just read that in Revelation. When John sees the city, he also sees the bride. Because it's holy, pure, clean. She's prepared herself for Jesus. Just as God has prepared for us a city, this Kodesh. She's clean. Okay, jump to Isaiah 48. Isaiah 48 and verse 2. So that's the first couple of things to understand about holiness. Let's look at some more. Just looking at where God's city is called holy. Holiness itself is such a massive topic, we, we'd never get through it. But if we just look at where it refers to the city. Okay then, you who call yourselves citizens, i.e. people from that city. People who belong to that city. Yeah? Are you going to heaven? <laughs> you don't have to be reserved about that, you know. <laughs> right? The, the Christians, they're so, oh, oh I don't, I'm not good. At, you never were good enough. We know that. Is Jesus good enough? Yes. Right, to get us in? Yes. Right, okay. We, we go into this city, aren't we? Yes. Right, because if, you, if you're saved, you go into this city. If you believe in Jesus, he's prepared this city for us. That's where he's taking us. It's, in a sense, it's where we are now in the church. So you call yourself a citizen, yeah? Of what? Heaven? No, of the holy city. Are you a citizen of the holy city? You see, the average Christian, if you said, are you going to heaven? You'd say, yes, because I believe in Jesus. If you said, are you holy? They'd go, oh, no, not quite. <laughs> you know, your passport, I keep using this illustration, that's where you're from, isn't it? Right? None of you are good enough to come from Barnsley, but you do. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a statement of fact. You call yourselves citizens of what? Jerusalem? No, the holy city. And you claim to rely on the God of Israel. The Lord Almighty is his name. Isaiah's actually rebuking the Israelites. He's saying, look guys, you say you're citizens, you are from the holy city. Guess what that means? It means you're holy. The problem is they didn't want to be. And so terrible things came to them. And this is what Isaiah's trying to address here. He actually addresses it throughout his whole, uh, his whole city. So it's not just the city of peace. It's not just the city of joy. It's not just the city that God loves. It's the city that God has called us into holiness. We claim to rely on God... Well, if we do, then we are supposed to be set apart for sacred use. Now, why is Isaiah rebuking them? Because what they're starting to do, and what they have been doing for a while, they've started to decrease the holiness in Jerusalem. So it's becoming less holy, if you can understand that concept, which is an alien concept to God. Because as you grow in marriage, you become more like each other. Have you noticed that? Have you noticed? Dennis, Sandra, have you noticed that? I mean, Carolyn only gets halfway through a sentence now and I finish it. <laughs> right, she tells me what I'm having for tea because she knows what I want. You know, you just become... You, you don't grow further apart... Not if your marriage is right. You don't stop knowing what, what does he want for tea. I have no idea. I have no idea what he wants for tea. You, you grow closer together. And, and, and Jerusalem's getting further away from God. And so God keeps telling them, look, if you do this, you're going to be separated from me altogether. That's what happens even in marriages, sadly. And so they're called the citizens of the holy city for a specific reason, but they're not doing it. Jeremiah addresses the same thing. Go to Je Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 24. You see, this has massive ramifications for your life 
if you don't understand what holiness is. You're going to end up in real trouble. Just as your marriage would end in real trouble if you think you can belong to someone else as well. Well, your marriage is doomed. Because you can't. But if you are careful to obey me, remember Jerusalem is getting further away from God and it should be getting closer to him. But if you are careful to obey me, declares the Lord, and bring no load through the gates of this city on the Sabbath. Now, what's he talking about here? They had very strict rules of holiness. One of the main rules of holiness was one day out of seven belongs to God, which the Jews now keep so strictly, they sort of sometimes forget what the meaning was. Bring no load of the gates through the city on the Sabbath, but keep the Sabbath day holy. So the principle of the city, the city gates, is you don't, you don't diminish the holiness by bringing something into the city that's not holy on the holy day. On the Sabbath, the day of holiness, don't do work that God doesn't want done. But keep the Sabbath day holy by not doing any work on it. But what were they doing? They were bringing stuff into the city. Yeah? Now, there's lots of things you could look at. You could look at all the sins they were doing. They were even worshipping false gods. They were doing all kinds of crazy stuff. But what I want us to see is the principle of holiness pertaining to the city. What they were doing, they were bringing into the city something that shouldn't be there. In a basic understanding. Certainly on the day it shouldn't be done. Do you know Christians are doing this all the time? Well, if you do, you'll reap the same judgment they reaped. Because you shouldn't be doing that. Nothing unholy should be brought into God's holy city. Nothing should be brought in to contaminate the church. The Sabbath, the holiness of God in a, in a day. Remember, God, God blessed the Sabbath and called it holy. Jesus is our full expression of Sabbath. Not doing any work on it. Go to the next verse. The kings who sit on David's throne will come through the gates of this city with their officials. They and their officials will come riding on chariots and horses, accompanied by the men of Judah and those living in Jerusalem, and this city will be inhabited forever. Jeremiah is saying, if you keep my city holy then it'll be blessed forever. It'll be inhabited, you'll have, the, you'll have proper leadership, you'll have all the good blessing of God, but only if you don't bring in the things that reduce holiness. Now, the word we use for that is, remember the word uh, for holiness is also the word sacred. So when you... Remove holiness, we call it desacred or de desecrate. That's what desecration means. You have desecrated that. You have removed holiness. You have contaminated. You have polluted. You have defiled. Does that mean you've done something really wicked? No. It means you have brought something in and made something happen that God didn't want. That's why God, through the Bible, emphasizes the Sabbath. You shouldn't be doing that. Not, not today. God limits it just to one day and says, look, at least one day, make sure you're not doing the things I don't want you to do. Make sure you're doing only the holy things. They couldn't even do that. Never mind their entire lives. You asked them to do it for one day, and they still wouldn't do it. They still wanted that day to do what they wanted, to bring into the city the things that desecrated. They did their own work. Can your own work remove holiness? Yes. Of course it can. If you decide you're going to do what you want, that's not holiness. Because holiness is doing what God wants. This is the definition of holiness. In the temple, the temple was holy. 
Right? The priests had to do what God had said in the holy temple. They were put on holy garments. The holy anointing oil was put on them. They went into the holy place with the holy fire and the holy incense with the holy sacrifices on the holy table into the holy of holies, all holy. And if they did what God want, the blessing was upon them and, and the blessing on Israel. Two of, two of uh, the high priest's sons went in and did what they wanted and God killed them. But they were serving God. Yeah, but they were doing it in a way they wanted to do it. That's desecration. You're not, and God says, you didn't treat my presence, my temple, my articles, my city as holy. Yeah, but God lowers his standards in the New Testament. No, he doesn't. One of the first things God did in the New Testament were kill two people because they were lying about what they were doing with the money. They were defiling God's church. They were lying to the Holy Spirit. You're lying. You're putting on an act. You're not doing what's right. Therefore, they died. Ananias and Sapphira. Why did God do that? Because he's not lowered his standards. God's holiness is God's holiness. It's his holy word. It's his holy presence. It's his holy temple. Let's go back to Isaiah then, a different verse. Isaiah 62 and verse 12. You see, God's, God's holiness is a very serious issue. When Isaiah was in God's presence, he was a priest worshipping God, but when he saw the seraphim saying, holy, 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 covering their eyes, he says, I'm a man of unclean lips. He recognized, I'm not holy. I'm saying what I want to say instead of what God wants me to say. Now Isaiah is speaking of what happens after the punishment. They will be called the holy people. Why? They live in the holy city. He's just told us that. The redeemed of the Lord. If you're redeemed, if you're saved, you're called to be holy. Don't say you're called to be saved but not holy. It's, it's the same principle. The redeemed of the Lord and you will be called sought after. God's looking for you to make you holy. He seeks you. He's trying to find you. And you will be called sought after. The city... Remember, we're just looking at how this applies to the city. The city no longer deserted. You see, what had happened, this is talking and prophesying about what happens after they were punished. Jeremiah said they would be punished, and they were. What was their punishment? They were taken out of the city. They were taken out of Jerusalem, the city of God, and they were put in Babylon, the city of this world. That is the worst punishment you can think of, you know. When a man was committing adultery in the church, Paul said, put him out. Take him out of the city, put him in the world. Paul used this phrase, I've handed him over to Satan. And you'll find that in the Bible, in the New Testament, more than once, put them out to be taught not to blaspheme. Put them out so their flesh can be dealt with. They will learn what it's like to live in Babylon, because Babylon will kill you. God loves you. The punishment of rejecting God's holiness is to have to leave the city. We'll look at that in the coming weeks. A city sought after, the city no longer, the city no longer deserted. You see, God is never going to desert his holy city. But people who refuse holiness will be removed from the city. The city will stand. The people who are holy and who belong to God, they will stand. They will be there. But those who reject God's holiness, well, they won't be in the city. Because this is what God did. God has never deserted his ultimate city. He's been building it from the foundation of time. But there are people that God threw out. Lots of people, actually, if you read the Bible, that's what God did. God's not going to leave you if you're holy in his city. But there's lots of people God left. There's lots of people God's presence departed from. There's lots of people, even the king, King Saul, it says God, God departed from him. Why? He didn't want to live in holiness. He wanted to do what he wanted. And that's not what God's principle is. Let's jump to the end of time again then. Revelation 22 and verse 19. Revelation 22 and verse 19. So understand I'm talking about holiness from the context of the city not of a principle in all our lives. I actually preached on holiness a few months ago, so 
you can look at that in more detail. I'm talking about the city, the place. If anyone takes words away from this scroll of prophecy, God will take away from that person any share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this scroll. So at the end of Revelation, God is saying, look, if you take away my words, if you try and say I'm not saying what I'm saying, you're not getting in that city. If you're picking and choosing which words you want, if you're taking away the bits of the Bible you don't like, you won't be in that city because all God's word is holy. It's his holy Bible. And all God's people are called to be holy. And all God's church is called to be holy. And they're all filled with his Holy Spirit. And so that's why we're going to the holy city. That's what it's called at the end. Right at the end of the Bible, it's not just called Jerusalem. It's called the holy city. And so if you reject this, God says, okay, you won't be there. It's not God punishing you. It's just a statement of fact. If you're citizens of the holy city, you want to be holy. If you don't want to be holy, you don't want to be in that city. Because holiness means you totally belong to God. Holiness means you're set apart to be used by God. You're sanctified. You're sacred. You have given yourself to him. It's not just uh, these things we've looked at. It's absolute ownership. Does God own us? Does God do, are we used for God? That's what this word means. We are used for God. But here... It's in the context of your inheritance. God will take, take away your share in the holy city. Now, Jesus says, in my father's house are many rooms. King James says many mansions. And so you have an inheritance in God. God has prepared something for you. Did you know that? It's a place in the holy city. You know, we've just been on holiday, and when I'm on holiday, you look at, I, I, I have a degree in housing, as you know, so I studied housing, and I love to look at all the houses and, like, dream, Would it, wouldn't it be wonderful if I lived there? You know, we hired a boat for the day, and we went out in the sea, we were looking at all these mansions on the top of the cliffs overlooking the Mediterranean. It's like, oh, if only, if only I could live there, wouldn't that be beautiful? Well, you've got a, you've got a better inheritance in heaven. You've got a house in the holy city. There's no contamination. There's no defilement there. There's nothing. It's beautiful. It's your inheritance. That's what you do. You leave an inheritance for your children. They get your house. Jesus is giving us an inheritance. But if you don't want holiness, you won't have that inheritance because you don't want it. It's not just by saying I want it, it's by whether you're living in relationship with it. We just looked at it when we were talking then about Father's Day. Elisha inherited a double portion. Why? Because he was in living relationship with his spiritual father. So it was passed on. If you don't want to live in holiness, well, you're not going to go to the holy city, are you? By definition, it's not what you're seeking. You're seeking things of this world. No, we're, we're looking towards this inheritance, this ownership. Jump to Matthew uh, 27, verse 53. So Jesus got us that inheritance. His death and resurrection purchased that inheritance for us, yeah? When, when Jesus paid the price at Calvary, the other tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people, yeah, who had died, were raised to life, so it's a, it's a picture here of the final resurrection, God's principles never change, they came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection, right, the tombs split open when Jesus died, but they didn't come back to life till Jesus came alive, yeah, our life is when, is in Christ, if he's not alive, we're not going to live, and went into the holy city. As I've said, it's only seven times it's called the holy city in, in the New Testament. Why, does it, why here does God call Jerusalem the holy city? Because it's the holy people that are resurrected 
So what are they going to do? They're going to go to the holy city. Why? That's their inheritance. When you are resurrected, when a holy person is resurrected, they go to the place that God had prepared for them to live. So when the holy people rise, what are they going to do? They're going to go into the holy city. They're going to go where, they, where their house is. They're going to go to their mansion. They're going to go to the place God's prepared for them. When you are resurrected, that's where you're going. If you're a holy person, if you belong to God, if you're used by God, if you're set apart by God, if you give yourself to God, if God owns you, all these aspects of holiness, then you have this inheritance. That's where you're going. Just as they did it, you're going to do it. You're going to go into the holy city. That's where your property, your inheritance is. That's why in the Old Testament, when people, even before they died, you think of people like Joseph or Jacob, when they were dying, they says, you must take my bones back to the holy land. Because that's where my inheritance is. Not in Egypt. Don't leave me here. Because then when I'm resurrected, I've got a really long walk. Well, that's the only logic I can think of, because what difference does it make where you die? If you die in Egypt, you're still going to, you're still going to heaven, aren't you? So why did Joseph and Jacob say, you've got, to, you've got to take my bones and bury it? Because when they get resurrected, they want to go straight to where they live. You know, that's why I was annoyed on our holiday, why we got delayed, because I wanted to go straight on holiday. I don't want to wait in an airport for a few days. I don't want to wake up in Egypt and go, what am I doing here? It's a 10-day walk to the promised land to the holy land. No, we, we want to live holy now so that we can be in the holy place, the holy city that God has called us to. Let's go back to Isaiah then. Isaiah 52 verse 1. Just look at a couple more. Isaiah 52 and verse 1. Awake, awake Zion. Obviously, J Jerusalem in its, its heavenly aspect. Clothe yourself with strength. Put on your garments of splendor, Jerusalem, the holy city. The uncircumcised and defiled will not enter you again. Right, Isaiah now, again, is prophesying about what happens after they'd been thrown out of the city and when they returned. What he's saying, what's he saying? He's saying, okay, the holy city, the uncircumcised, the flesh, the defiled, they can't come in again. You saw what happened when you let them in. What happened? The city went into captivity. The city was destroyed. People were thrown out of the city. Now you've learned that. Now you've learned what happens when you let the defiled in. When you let the uncircumcised in, you realize it's not going to happen again. Have you learned that? Not one person. When you allow desacredization, desecration to be allowed in the church, the church collapses and people are thrown out. Have you learned that? Well, I've seen that happen over and over and over again. You don't let it in. Oh, it'll be all right. Will it? Oh, just let them off. Just let them do what they want. Really? You mean defile the holiness of God? Read Corinthians. This is what Paul's talking about. Do you not know if you allow that, the whole church becomes defiled? Do you not know if you let that person do that, the entire church is going to go down? Do you not know that? Oh, it'd be all right. He's a nice guy. No, he's not. Next verse. Verse 2. Shake off the dust. Rise up. Sit enthroned. Jerusalem. Free, he's talking to the city. Free yourself from the chains of your neck, daughter of Zion, now a captive. So he's prophesying to them that they're in captivity, he's saying, look, if you understand now you're in captivity because you allowed defilement into this city, if you understand that and you'll be cleansed from that and circumcised from that, you can come back in. The man thrown out of the church in Corinth, later Paul says, look, if he's, if he's truly repented, let him back in. If he's truly repented. Let them back in, but don't defile the church. What caused the city to be destroyed? What caused all the people to be thrown out of the city? Unholiness. 
desecration. Allowing stuff to happen in the church that God has said mustn't happen. If we do this, you lose everything. Because it doesn't take much. I mean, we've just had a perfect example, haven't we? Through the whole COVID thing. You know, you have to stay in isolation for 10 days. Why? Because you came close to someone in Asda who happened to have it. Yes, because if you've got that virus and you don't, if you go to church, then anyone in church might catch that. Oh, it's no big deal. It is if it kills someone. It is if you contaminate someone who's vulnerable. Oh, I can just get away with doing this in church. You might think you can, but that person can't. And if you do it, they'll do it. And before you know it, the whole thing's contaminated and you've lost half the church. And the young people haven't got a clue what's going on. You appoint that leader who's just after his own selfish ambition and his own carnality at making himself famous and before you know it, you've got a whole church of people behaving like that. And then the church is doomed. You've desecrated it. Desecrated. Made it unholy. But the, the captivity could come back. Nehemiah 13 verse 17. So they came back. What did they come back to? The city. If you come back to God, if you're backslidden, if you're away from God, if you've sinned and turned away from God, you want to come back to God, let me tell you something. This is a really spiritual, insightful thing. You've got to go to church. It's the city of God. Well, we believe in God in Babylon. Well, you'll not live very long because that's not where your inheritance is. Your inheritance is in the city of God. Not Babylon. The Tower of Babel's not going to save you. It's the new Jerusalem. So Nehemiah comes back and he rebuilds the city and he's going to make it holy. And then he goes away and he comes back again. And he finds out they're doing the same things again. They're desecrating. They're, making the, they're allowing unholy things back into the city. I rebuke the nobles. The guys in charge were promoting this. I rebuked the nobles of Judah and said to them, what is this wicked thing you are doing? Desecrating the Sabbath. What were they doing again? The city was allowing things in on the Sabbath that they shouldn't have been doing. You're desecrating it. Let's read down. Didn't your ancestors do the same things so that our God brought all this calamity on us and the city? It's the city that gets punished. It's the city that, that ends up in trouble. It's the church that ends up with all kinds of problems because some people bring stuff in that shouldn't be brought in and the nobles were allowing it to happen. Now you are stirring up more wrath against Israel by desecrating the Sabbath. Judgment's coming again now. Didn't, didn't you enjoy the judgment enough last time that you want it to come again? Do you want all that punishment again? Next verse. When evening shadows fell on the gates of Jerusalem, look, remember we're looking at the aspect of the city. Before the Sabbath, I ordered the doors to be shut and not opened until the Sabbath was over. I stationed some of my own men at the gates so that no load could be brought in on the Sabbath day. What's he saying? Look, if it, if it comes to it, I'm going to shut the doors of the city and no one can come in. That's not very evangelistic, is it? We twist God's holiness so that we think it means you can allow anything to happen. And that's the opposite of what it means. It's not what it means at all. They say, right, I'm closing the doors. And I think this is what a lot of the COVID thing's been about. God's, God's tolerated, if you can use that word, so much nonsense in the church, he shut it. And then he's dealt with all this sin behind closed doors. And it's amazing what, what's been happening. And now he's opening the doors again. He's saying, don't allow it in again. Or, or the judgment's going to come again. We cannot desecrate the holy place. It brings destruction. Jump to verse 11 of Nehemiah. You see, Nehemiah verse 1. You'll notice Nehemiah, he was doing such an obvious thing, but he got such opposition. Have you noticed that? Right, let's rebuild the church, and this time we'll make it, we'll make it good. People were trying to kill him. 
because they wanted their say in what happened. You got, you know, those those people like you know, Tobiah. They, they, they're saying, "Let us come and do our stuff in there." No, no, no. I don't want you to do that. Why not? Because we want to keep it holy. So I rebuke the official. I feel sorry for Nehemiah. He was always telling people off. That's why no one liked him, except God. So I rebuke the officials and ask them, why is the house of God neglected? Then I called them together and stationed them at their post. Go to verse... Uh, I've read that, and that's totally the wrong scripture. I don't know, but it fits in. Anyway, go to Nehemiah chapter 11 and verse 1. Now the leaders of the people settled in Jerusalem. He's getting everyone to come back and build church up again. The rest of the people cast lots to bring one out of every ten of them into Jerusalem, the holy city, while the remaining nine were to stay in their own towns. Let's read down. The people commended all who volunteered to live in Jerusalem. He's trying to get people to come back to church. Do you know why he's trying to do that? They didn't want to. He's actually having to use a lottery system to get you to come to church. Now, it's a biblical lottery system because it's the principle of the tithe. Uh, and these are the provincial leaders who settled in Jerusalem. You know, the Israelites, the priests, the Levites, the temple servants. Well, they should have been there anyway. You're a temple servant. Where do you live? Well, up in Galilee. Well, how can you work in the temple if you live in Galilee? Well, it's nice in Galilee. It's got a lovely lake. I like water skiing. Do you make your life's principles based on your own preferences or on what God's called you to do? This is an important thing. He says one out of every ten. It's the principle of the tithe. The tithe, ten percent always belongs to God. He's saying, look, I haven't, I haven't even got ten percent of the people wanting to be holy. Imagine God not even having ten percent of his own people wanting to be holy. That would never happen now, would it? We're all supposed to be holy. That's why so many people argue about the tithe, whether you should or whether you shouldn't. That's, you're missing the point. The point is everything you are should belong to God. 10% is just the basic principle of understanding of what belongs to God. If you can't give 10% for God, don't tell me your life belongs to God. If you're the bride, you, you, you own everything. My wife never says to me, do I have to give 10% to you? She gives everything to me because she knows it's all hers anyway. <coughs> yeah? That's the principle of belonging to God. You give everything to God because you know it's all yours anyway. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, don't you know all things are yours? What are you arguing about? And so you've got this principle, the principle of ownership. When you're in Jerusalem, the holy city, God says, you're mine. I would have been, even now today, I'd, I mean, if someone said to me, do you want to go live in Jerusalem? I, ah, yes, absolutely. I'd go live there. Wake up every morning, look at the holy city. Wow, what an amazing, certainly have a holiday home there. Won't be able to afford one though. Have you seen the prices in Jerusalem? It's the most expensive piece of real estate on the planet. Did you know that? There's a reason why. The spiritual principle. That's where Jesus is coming. And so you've got this principle. They didn't want to live there. I don't want to be holy. You don't want to be totally owned by God. You don't want to be used by God. You don't want God to live with you and give you everything. No, I want to do my own thing. But it won't bring you contentment or happiness or blessing. Only, only doing the will of God brings that. Surely we've learned that by now. Are we owned by God? But here's, here's something so amazing. Look at this one, Psalm 46, verse 5. Now we know this through the teachings of the whole Bible. But we're talking about the city of God. The city of God. Go to verse 4. 
There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at the break of day. The holy city, the city of God, the holy place. It's not just, it's not just something that's set apart, sacred, used by God. It's not just ownership or belonging to God, all these things we've looked at. It's the place that God lives in. God only lives in something when it's holy. He came and dwelt in the holy temple when it was holy. He's going to live in the holy city, the New Jerusalem, because it's holy. He dwelt in the holy of holies above the holy ark of the covenant because he's holy. He lives in this city. God is within her, female, his bride. The reason you are holy is because God lives in you. Doesn't just own you. Doesn't just love you. Doesn't just want to fulfill you and flow through you and use you for his glory. No, he, he actually lives inside you. If you want to be holy. Because God says, be ye holy for I am holy. And so... When God comes and lives in you, it's because, it's because he's declaring you as holy. You are holy if God lives in you. Therefore, don't use your body for un something unholy. Don't desecrate the city again. God is within her. It's this oneness that Christ talked about so much. The Hebrew understanding of Echad, this oneness. Here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. When man joins his wife, they become one. When God dwells in his church by the Spirit, they become one. Why? The Holy Spirit is now living in his holy church. God's in you. The holiness of God is in you. That's why you can be holy. Don't think it's some attainment that can't be achieved. That's not the understanding. Of course it can't be achieved by you. We're all defiled. But the Holy One Christ went to a holy God, giving a holy and perfect sacrifice so he could send the Holy Spirit to be on a holy church because we've repented of our sins and we've now given our bodies as living sacrifices to a holy God. So therefore, we are going to be holy because God has made us holy. And this is why all the prophets talked about this. Daniel would pray towards the holy city because he knew they'd been in captivity because they'd been unholy. But he said they're going to come back and they're going to be holy. And so Jesus is going to return. We'll close with this, Zechariah chapter 8, verse 2. Zechariah chapter 8, verse 2. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I am very jealous for Zion, the city of God. I am burning with jealousy for her. Next verse. This is what the Lord says. I will return to Zion and dwell in Jerusalem. Then Jerusalem will be called the faithful city and the mountain of the Lord Almighty will be called the holy mountain. But this is talking about the return of Jesus. Jesus is returning for his holy ones. The Bible is very clear about this. In fact, Enoch prophesied, and it's repeated there in the book of Jude. See, I see the Lord coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones. His holy ones are with him. He's coming for his holy people because he's taking them to the city the holy city. And so holiness, the understanding and the, the concept and the whole meaning of what this is, is tied up with the holy city. You are called citizens of the holy city. You're his holy bride, his holy church, his holy people, set apart, consecrated, sanctified, made pure and holy for his use to be used 
holy unto him so that you will bring the glory of God through your lives doing what God has called you to do. Not bringing your own loads in, not, not telling God what is going to happen in his city, not telling God what you're going to use your life for. No, you're going to use it for his glory, holiness. We belong to him. Can the team come up, please? So before we take Holy Communion, let me read this scripture. Daniel chapter 9, verse 16. Daniel was praying that there be a return to holiness. Lord, in keeping with all your righteous acts, turn away your anger and your wrath from Jerusalem, your city, your holy hill. Our sins and the iniquities of our ancestors have made Jerusalem and your people an object of scorn to all those around us. Let's read down. Now, our God, hear the prayers and petitions of your servant for your sake, Lord, Look with favor on your desolate sanctuary. One more verse, or two more verses. Give ear, O God, and hear. Open your eyes and see the desolation of the... He's praying for the city, right? That God's had to throw his people out. That bears your name. We do not make requests of you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. Lord, listen. Lord, forgive Lord, hear and act. For your sake, my God, do not delay. Why? Because your city and your people bear your name. We're going to sing a song of worship, but then we're going to come to communion. The, the prayer was answered. Jesus came and took away the sin. And he brought redemption for the city. His holy body was broken and his holy blood was shed so that we can enter the city of God. And we can be holy. So the team are going to lead us in a song of praise. We're going to worship the Lord. And then we're going to break bread together. As Jesus answered our prayers to make us holy. Let's worship the Lord as the team leaders. Thank you, team. <laughs>